This meeting of the Independent School District Number 535. This uh, school board's called to order at 5.30 p.m. Tuesday, April 16, 2019, in room 137 of the Edison Building. Present at the board table is Mr. Michael Munoz, Superintendent of Schools, and a non-voting ex-officio member of the board. Also present is Ms. Wendy Edgar, the Assistant Board Clerk. Ms. Edgar, would you please call the roll? Ms. Amundsen? Here. Chair Barlow? Here. Ms. Marvin? Here. Ms. Nathan? Here. Mr. Schlusner? Here. Ms. Seelinger? Here. Ms. Workman? Here. Mr. Munoz. Yes, tonight we have the honor of uh, members of the Gibbs Student Council who's gonna lead us into pledge tonight. Let's stand as we're able. Parents, you can come closer if you care to take pictures. <laughs> Again, this is Gibbs Elementary Student Council. Point zero one approval of agenda. This is an action item, Mr. Munoz. There are no changes. Move of approval. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Announcements and communications. 3.01 recognitions. Mr. Munoz. Yes, at this time I'm going to call Principal Matt Ruzik from Riverside Elementary. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a real honor. I'm going to ask that Rachel Eggert come up and join me up here, even though she doesn't want to. <laughs> uh, it's my honor tonight to recognize, um, and we don't have the official certificate um, because that was postponed due to snow. Um, but um, we are really super fortunate to have Rachel Eggert. She's our school guidance counselor at Riverside. She has been for a number of years, and she is an unbelievable asset to us and our kids, and she was recognized, um, deservedly so, as the Southeastern Minnesota Counselor of the Year. So I'm bringing to you uh, the greatest counselor in all of Southeastern Minnesota, Rachel <laughs> Eggert. <laughs> so Rachel does not want to speak. Uh, <laughs> So I will just say, um, uh, if you need any advocates for the role of a counselor, they just need to come and watch Rachel for a couple of minutes and they'll recognize the value of her. Our kids are um, so, so fortunate to have her. So we wanted to, uh, to celebrate her a little bit and I won't ask her to say anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Uh, I'm gonna call Amy Ike. Uh, today we're gonna recognize the State Science Fair. Good evening, board. I'm actually going to hand this off to Amanda Lambert, who was our uh, Rochester Regional Science and Engineering Fair Director this year. And can all of the state science fair participants join us up here? 
you speak here and we can kind of form a line facing the board, if you would. Oh, face, face this way, guys. Facing the board, yeah. This way. Face the board. Where, where are we? Facing the line, like right along the black line. There you go. There you go. There we go. There you go. Got it. Hello. I'm Amanda Lambert, and then I have the honor tonight. Oh, here we go. I'll start over. I'm Amanda Lambert, as Amy said. And I am the Rochester Regional Science and Engineering Fair Director, and I have the honor of introducing these young men um, here. And there were many women participants, too, in this fair. And um, all of these participants went to the state fair. And so we're just going to go over a little bit um, of some of the facts and fun things that we did this year so far. So can you see that? Do you want me to say them? Okay. So our regional fair was held on the 14th of February, and we had 241 participants, grades 6 through 12, here in Rochester at the Technical College. And all of the fair participants had a chance to qualify for state. And our region had 13 high school and 12 middle school students who did attend um, the state science fair this past March 31st through the um, March 30th through the 31st in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. And you'll see some of the representatives here. Um, and then here are some fair facts: more than 400 middle school and high school students from across Minnesota came together on the um, 30th through the 31st at the Earl Brown Heritage Center in Brooklyn, Minnesota to compete at the 82nd Annual um, Science Fair, the Minnesota State Science Fair. These students were selected from 2,500 students statewide around the region in the um, state regional science fairs. And now what they're going to do is they're going to each introduce themselves. They'll talk about their projects and some of the awards that they won. And then you can ask them any kind of questions that you have. Uh, my name is Daniel Fleury. I'm a junior from John Marshall High School, and uh, recently my project involved essentially deploying a mobile application that's able to essentially diagnose um, like 14 different lung conditions in real time, and it's supposed to it has the objective of, of essentially diagnosing um, 13 to 14 different lung diseases diseases in under like five seconds. Um, and some of my recent awards, I was fortunate enough to win. Uh, it was like the gold medal at the uh, the Minnesota State Science and Engineering Fair, I got into ISEF, uh, which essentially is the International Science and Engineering Fair, which is going to be hosted at uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and it's essentially where you have uh, like dozens of like internationals, uh, international uh, like science organizations like uniting and uh, sharing their projects. And then I got the first place 3M grand prize, and then I got the first place uh, International Photonics Award which is like um, an international like photonics conference. And then uh, I got the Yale Science and Engineering Award. So. Wow. <laughs> Hi, I'm Andrew Tao. I'm a sophomore at Rogers Century. My project was basically or essentially uh, applying deep convolutional neural networks to accurately identify skin lesion type imagery. Um, basically, similar to Daniel's project, I identified nine different types of skin lesions in real time. I developed a deployable app to do this, and I could also identify whether or not uh, these skin lesions were malignant or benign, so cancerous. Uh, at the State Science Fair project, I won the uh, bronze medal, so not as high of an, an honor as Daniel's, but um, I still had a really good time. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Noah Wingle. This is my partner here, Alec Flanagan Warren. Yeah. Oh. So we'll just keep going with that. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, we got our Fred Middle School in eighth grade. Uh, our project was the effects of propeller pitch. Basically, what we did is we took uh, we three printed propellers and we changed the pitch on the blade, each of those, and we, uh, each like that, and then we tested them uh, thoroughly for efficiency and stuff like that. Um, our awards consisted of the. Uh, uh, we won the MAS Gold Award, the Seagate Emerging Scientist Award. Uh, Broadcom Master's Award, and the Beckman Coulter Engineering Award for Middle School Engineering, uh, once again, second place. 
All right, that's it. Yeah. Hi, I'm Hemanth Asarvatham. I'm a junior at uh, Century High School. Uh, my project was about using um, basically a new way to trying to create a new way to treat glaucoma using electric fields to destroy the cells that cause um, glaucoma. Um, and uh, at the state science fair, I won uh, a bronze medal and um, uh, the Seagate Rising Star Award. So, fun. <laughs> Uh, hello, my name is Benjamin Yan, and I'm currently a junior at Century High School. And my project involved building an automated program for verifying catheter placement for certain types of radiation treatments. And some of the awards that I won at uh, the, the State Science Fair were the, bron the Bronze Medal and a trip to ISF. Thank you. My name is Micah Williams. My name is Ayub Jilao. And um, we did a project where we tested a chemical called new nicotinoids um, on zebrafish embryos and the effects of them. Um, last year we did this project in Winda State. This year we did the same project, but we also tested a second chemical, an eco-friendly version of it, to try to get a safer version of the chemical. And we found that um, it actually the eco-friendly killed way more than the um, regular pesticide. And at State we won a bronze medal. Hi, my name is Tan May Iyer. I'm a freshman at Mayo High School. Um, my project was on the uh, general water quality across Rochester, Minnesota. I compared well and municipal and created projections for things during the summer and winter. And I guess the conclusion was we're good. <laughs> and uh, I'll be going to the National Science Fair for Stockholm Water, the Stockholm Water Science Fair. I'm not exactly sure what it's called, but yeah, that's in Ohio. <laughs> Uh, before uh, just any of you, some of you are juniors or sophomores this year, right? And a freshman. I'll have to admit that I didn't understand at half of your projects, but <laughs> that's that's awesome. But uh, you might want to consider the incubator EDU class that we're offering next year. I mean, it's really designed to c create a product or a service, and then turn it into a business. So. If you haven't looked at it, you might want to think about that for next year. Boy, and I just want to say, when I was in high school, um, a big deal science project was getting a plastic cup, putting dirt and a seed in it um, <laughs> to see if it would grow. Um, Water helps. Mine never, mine never did. This is stunning. You are stunning. And in addition to creating an amazing future for yourselves, you are such great role models for other young people. Thank you. And before you take your seats, why don't you turn around so you're proud parents. And we should ask the parents to stand, because uh, yes. they're probably going to, we want to acknowledge the parents, but also give you an opportunity to take pictures of your. Uh... Thank you. Three oh two informational cradle to career, Mr. Muno. Yes, at this time I'm gonna call Julie Brock, Executive Director of Cradle to Career. I have a slide. Yes. Hi, board. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Um, I excited to let you know what is happening with Cradle to Career. Um, I'm also uh, very um, honored that I have representation from the board on our board. So thank you, Kathy and Don and Mike and Amy for uh, being part of this journey with us. Uh, Cradle to Career, um, I'm not gonna go through the entire history. I have provided you with a, a paper there, but in short, um, the community is hopeful that we are able to make some very um, good investments and, support and, and put some supports in place that allows the community to come alongside RPS and help our students and our teachers succeed as you continue to innovate forward for every single one of our kids in our district. So um, 
if you flip over to the back side, we're just gonna skip that front one. Um, I guess on the front one, I'm just keeping you alive. Okay, so if you go back to the front one, there we have seven outcomes that we are focused on right now. These were um, uh, created by the leadership table and the planning committee um, in 2018, at the top of 2018. I'm proud to say that right now we have opened the kindergarten readiness can, so that's the first green one there. And we've also done the first purple one. We have that can open, uh, which is 12th grade on time graduation or high school graduation. Um, our numbers have come back um, on both, both of those kickoff meetings. We had over 25 organizations um, across the community represented um, and we have some great momentum going forward and excitement about what they are going to do as they start to align their uh, data and their program outcomes toward those upward outcomes. You will see on the bottom, we just have our, our starting data. That's, those, that's the, where the journey begins. So we are hopeful that we'll be able to turn the curve. That's the whole purpose that, of our organization is to um, start to increase those numbers by coming alongside and, and um, working with the district. I'm also happy to report that in both the Kindergarten Readiness CAN and the 12th Grade Collaborative Action Network, that's what CAN stands for, um, there was uh, RPS uh, representation in both of those. So our teachers, our educators, and our leadership team are there. So very exciting. Now, if you go to page two, I won't go through the excellence for everyone, but that is what we uh, aspire for. Our vision at Cradle to Career is that we will create a healthy community for all. We know that that cannot be done in isolation. There's no possible way. So these coll collaborative action networks, we're hopeful that they continue to grow and they become a coalition of the community that wants to align their data, they want to see results, and they are willing to turn the curve with us in order to make sure that our kids are successful Cradle to Career. On the bottom there, you'll see this is our timeline. Um, leadership table uh, came to be in May of 2018. They did a wonderful job of getting our base funding in place. Um, they hired me in September and we've been on fire from that point on. Not only has leadership table also set our strategic priorities for the next three to five years in our direction for that, we also have staff in place to support our collaborative action networks. Some of the initiatives that we have, the uh, feedback that we've heard from the community on initiatives that have come before us before is that they need the infrastructure, need, they need the support. And so we're also happy to report that we uh, supplied results-based accountability training for our community partners um, in uh, early of this month in April. And then we also are trained as trainers. So we have two people on staff at Cradle to Career who can go and work with each of our community partners to make sure that they're all using the same common language when we talk about measurements and when we talk about outcomes. So we will be working and that is something that we are able to supply for our community partners free of charge um, because that we do not want them spending their capacity and their um, resources on training and that infrastructure piece, that's what we're about. And that is what I have for you this evening. Questions from members of the board? Do you want to talk about May 1st? I do want to tell, I do. I really do want to talk about May 1st. We're excited to say that on May 1st, from four to six at John Marshall Cafeteria, we will be hosting our next community ro report out. Um, this event, we're um, excited because not only will we report on the progress that we've made so far, but also we will be engaging the community in a turn the curve exercise. And we will start um, also helping the community understand how to talk about cradle to career and also how to talk about outcomes in the same language. So come, be part of it, come on. <laughs> I've also asked uh, Julie to um, provide a briefing such as this, the second meeting of each, uh, second meeting of each upcoming month. So uh, we look forward to additional comments as you move forward. Mr. Munoz, was there anything else you wanted nope. to? Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Julie. 3.03, .03, High School Board Committee assignment updates. Are there any updates, any member of the board? We will be um, uh, later this week providing your updated committee assignments, but uh, there are uh, existing committee assignments you have. Anyone care to offer an update? Director Nathan. Um, I attended a meeting of um, 
the Under Construction Community Curriculum and Instruction Advisory Council. Um, we had um, a conversation about how we can better reach out to more parents to participate in the conversations about curriculum. And um, we have identified uh, community and district liaisons that are connected to various groups of parents that we might use to connect. So watch for some um, invitations for that. And um, we're gonna really ramp up our work um, mostly in the fall. But um, I think we've come up with a way to get parent input, um, perhaps without requiring a long commitment of time, which seems to have been the barrier to parents participating in the committee beforehand. Director Marvin. Thank you. Uh, the racial equity advisory team uh, w met last night and currently working on a collaboration with United Way to get trained in how to listen to community members, uh, especially those from marginalized communities so that we can hear what the needs are and bring those back to the board and to the district. Um, also the community and family engagement committee continues to meet, I think that's the name of it still, every month and uh, representatives from many of our schools, including a number of parents, come together and talk about the initiatives that they're working on. And so much of what they're doing feeds right into the uh, Cradle to Career initiative because it's all about outreach and finding out what people need, going to where they are, bringing them in, and just sort of wrapping the community around our kids, starting with our kids and then branching out from there. Thank you. Uh, consent agenda, this is an action item. Does anyone want any item removed for separate consideration? Move approval. Second. And moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Mr. Munoz. Yes, we have uh, sundry, several retirements we'd like to recognize. The first uh, in the teacher area, we have Cecilia Ding, Dinglady teacher of English learners at Sunset Terrace. She's retirement effective the end of June 3rd. She's been with the district 24 years. Margaret Hovel, teacher of English learners at Rochester Alternative Learning Center. Her retirement is effective the end of the day, June 3rd. And she's been with the district 22 years. Rebecca Johnson, second grade teacher at Washington Elementary. Retirement effective June 3rd. And she's been with the district 25 years. Valerie Kafka, math teacher at Century High School, retirement effective at the end of the day, June 3rd, and she's been with the district 34 years. Uh, Montgomery McKay, second grade teacher at George Gibbs Elementary, effective September 2nd, 2019. She's been with the district 32 years. Jack Samuel, science teacher at John Marshall High School, retirement at the end of the day, June 3rd. Uh, Jack has been with the district 28 years. P.J. Seidel, sixth grade teacher, Kellogg Middle School, retirement effective April 12th, 2019, and he's been with the district 31 years. Samuel Simmons, school counselor at Kellogg Middle School, retirement at the end of the day, June 3rd, been with the district 25 years. Paraprofessionals, Rebecca Benson, secondary paraprofessional in the library at John Marshall, retirement August 24, 2019. She's been with the district 21 years. James Gronbold, <coughs> special ed paraprofessional at John Marshall High School, retirement effective May 16th. Been with the district 16 years. Susan Olson, EL paraprofessional at Franklin Elementary, retirement effective May 31st. Been with the district 20 years, and then Scoot Nutrition Services, Robin Nelson, cashier at Kellogg Middle School, retirement at the end of the day, April 16th, and she's been with the district 33 years. We want to thank all of those individuals for their service to the district. Thank you. High Student Achievement <coughs> 5.01, resolution responding to recommendations of American Indian Education Parent Advisory Committee. Before that resolution is uh, read, uh, Mr. Munoz. Yes, I, just, I do want to bring to your attention, uh, we did make a slight change. We added uh, some additional uh, numbers, data. 
Uh, we met with uh, a few members of the advisory committee and I, I think we had a great meeting and um, they thought it was important and we agreed that that number should be part of that response. So we added that piece uh, to the resolution that you're gonna be acting on. Thank you. And Director Nathan. Uh, before the actual resolution is read, and uh, it is out of necessity a lengthy one, there is a recommendation of yes. change. Yes, I'd like to make an amendment to strike out the word parents under recommendation number eight, district response line three. I was in error asking for that to be added because the parents' perspective is added under the American Indian Parent Committee uh, completion of the rubric and the district team will consist of district leadership administrators and teachers so that covers that. Second. Been moved and seconded any discussion and um, in terms of procedure mm -hmm. since we haven't yet actually read the resolution for voting on I'll get to that now mm -hmm. Now, therefore, be it resolved as follows. The school board hereby approves the following responses to the advisory committee's recommendations. Recommendation number one, the advisory committee requested that the district hire a second American Indian education liaison in addition to the newly approved clerical support for the liaison. The district response, the district does not agree with the need to add an additional American Indian liaison. Currently there are 86 students who identify as American Indian using the federal race codes from our October 1st, 2018 enrollment count. The district acknowledges there are an additional 57 students who identify as American Indian according to the local code. This brings our total number of American Indian students to 143. We believe that the job duties of this position can be met by the 1.0 FTE. However, the district has recently added clerical hours to support the current American Indian liaison. The clerical support began on April 1st and will be monitored as to its effectiveness. Recommendation number two. The advisory committee requested a free opportunity for American Indian students to take the ACT in 10th grade District response, there are currently three American Indian students who are in their freshman year and seven that are sophomores. The district offers two proposals to address the need for ACT success. Option one, pay for the test for the current sophomores at a cost of $50 or 67 with writing. This may be an option during the day with the 11th grade class or on Saturday. The transportation to and from the test will be the responsibility of the parent guardian or option two. Pay for the community education course which prepares students to take the ACT test at a cost of $95. This is a day long course to prepare students to take the test. The transportation to and from the course will be the responsibility of the parent guardian. Recommendation number three, the advisory committee requested gifted and talented programming for American Indian students. District response, the district does not agree to add an additional gifted program for AI students. However, the principal on special assignment in the Office of Student Achievement, Monica Bowler, will continue to work with American Indian liaison to support American Indian students who qualify for gifted services. Monica Bowler will also work with American Indian Liaison to identify the different ways in which a student can qualify for gifted services. Recommendation number four, the advisory committee requested that the district provide data regarding special education and placement for American Indian students. District response, the district will provide to the American Indian Liaison the number of American Indian students who receive special education services by disability category according to the annual December 1st MDE child count, provided the information does not personally identify any students. Recommendation number five, 
The advisory committee requests that the American Indian Liaison be included in 504 plans and IEPs for American Indian students and including the Liaison in the Dream Catchers program. District responds. The district is supportive of the American Indian Liaison, providing support to students who are on a 504 plan or an individual education plan. We continue to strengthen relationships between the liaison and special education staff to improve and enhance communication and collaboration. The American Indian Liaison is welcome to attend 504 and IEP meetings at the request of the parent guardian. In regards to the Dream Catchers program, the district in collaboration with the American Indian Liaison will explore the program to consider implementing implementation in the future. Recommendation number six. The advisory committee requests that the district establish an HR policy to address Minnesota Statute 124D.77. Recruiting and retaining Indian teachers and leveraging network relationships with the committee. District response. The district will continue to, to comply with Minnesota State Statute 124D.77 with the assistance of the American Indian Liaison. The, the district has been posting all vacancies on the American Indian list serve through the University of Minnesota. The district will continue to work with the American Indian Parent Committee to identify and recruit American Indian candidates for open positions. Recommendation number seven. The advisory committee requests that the district implement and track a five-year curriculum timeline. District response. The district currently reviews curriculum using a process where we first study the content area and collect baseline data on our strengths and needs. Next, we review research regarding best practices. And finally, we create an implementation plan to support growth in that academic content area. <coughs> we plan to evaluate each of the areas as they come in our articulation cycle with regard to American Indian subject matter and create a plan to include multiple perspectives in our curricular areas. Recommendation number eight. The advisory committee requests that the district build a five-year plan for American Indian focused pre-service and in-service opportunities for all teaching, support, and administrative staff, and continue professional development regarding American Indian cultural sensitivity and inclusion that began in 2017. District response. In order to establish a baseline and monitor progress, the district requests that the American Indian Parent Committee, the, MD, the MDE, American Indian Education Programming Rubric, sorry, district response. In order to establish a baseline and monitor progress, the district requests that the American Indian Parent Committee complete the MDE American Indian Education Programming Rubric. The district will identify a team of stakeholders, department leadership, administrators, teachers, and students that will complete the rubric as well. The responses will be reviewed and averaged to create prioritized needs. These identified needs will then be used to create a five-year plan with a team of American Indian Parent Committee members and district staff. Recommendation number nine. Advisory committee requested increased engagement of the school board and administration at programs and events. District response. The American Indian Liaison will invite cabinet and members of the school board to all of the American Indian programs and events. The American Indian Liaison will work with the district communications department to post information on events on the website and social media. Additionally, Superintendent includes program and event updates in the weekly cabinet notes. In order to publicize these events in a timely manner, the district requests a list of meetings, events, and programs as soon as they are available so that they can be shared and saved on calendars. The district superintendent or his designee is directed to provide a copy of this resolution to the advisory committee to implement this resolution and to take other appropriate action to ensure the district is in compliance with the procedural requirements of Minnesota Statute 124D.778. I'm sorry. Finally, the school board thanks the members of the advisory committee 
for their input and their work on behalf of the district American Indian students. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Seven, efficient and effective operations. 7.01, resolution for safe routes to school, SRTS local coordinator grant briefing, Mr. Munoz. Yes, at this time, I'm gonna have Julie. Julie. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you are in the back. I'm looking in the crowd and say, oh, oh I don't see Julie. There, Julie. Sorry, Julie, I didn't see you back there. I'm kind of tall, so it's very rare that I can hide. <laughs> Good evening, board. Thank you so much for having us tonight to come and talk to you about a great opportunity for our students. Um, I am joined by Joanne Judge Dietz and Carrie Colling Anderson. Uh, Joanne, maybe I should let you kind of talk about your jobs first, and then we're going to dive in and talk to you about this grant. So my name is Joanne Judge Dietz, and I work at Olmsted County Public Health. For the last 10 years, I've worked on a grant, the Statewide Health Improvement Partnership which uh, is about starting health initiatives within the school. Uh, so uh, walking and biking and healthy eating are kind of the three uh, things that I, that I work on. And so uh, I worked with the district in things like walking to, walk to school day. I know many of you have participated in that. Bike to school day is coming up in May. Um, getting bikes in the schools, getting PE teachers educated. Those are kinds of some of the components really of Safe Roads to School. So that's been my job for the last 10 years. All right. Um, I'm Carrie Colling Anderson. I am the Community Schools Site Facilitator at Gage, and I am working with a committee of people on this grant, um, really from the perspective of being involved with getting kids to school at Gage, really figuring out how to remove barriers, and walking in safe routes is turning up to be a barrier for some. So that's kind of how I got involved with this. So uh, we want to talk to you a little bit about this grant, and this grant is coming out of the Department of Transportation, and they do things a little bit differently than we do. And so we are not presenting to you a grant tonight that we have received yet. <laughs> We're actually presenting a proposal. And one of the requirements that, that gains garners a few key points, I think, when we're looking at the rubric of points you can receive on the grant, is that the local school board uh, gives a resolution uh, in support of this grant. So the Department of Transportation does it a little bit differently. We're going to follow uh, their requirements, and we're bringing forward a proposal for this grant tonight, not a grant that we have already received. So um, you will see uh, that we have a broad idea of, of what we hope to do in this grant, uh, but there are still some things that need to be worked out, lots of details that need to be worked out, but we do know that um, there is a plan and there are a variety of stakeholders, both internal and external, that have been coming together to really plan um, for um, a great collaboration, a great opportunity for our students that live within the walk zones. So kind of the why, the piece that I just wanted to share that they created um, in writing this grant is that the vision is to create a culture within RPS whereby walking and biking are a safe, viable, equitable, and preferred method of travel for those within the walk zone. So really starting to look at how our kids are getting to school and um, the proposal of the grant includes a coordinator that would work with our elementary schools. Um, some of our elementary schools to kind of start to address what does that look like? What does walking to school look like? And there are a variety of components within that. Um, again, much of that to be hashed out once we receive the grant. Uh, but, but to really, what we want you to know now is that the proposal is that there will be a coordinator that will start to work with us, work with our community members, and tackle that safe walk zone issue, making sure that we can get more students uh, using the walk zones instead of getting rides to school um, or however else they get to school, but really encouraging walking to school if you live in that walk zone. Um, I think a couple, Joanne, you had a few things you wanted to share in relationship to um, what's going on with our community and this, the timeliness of this grant. Mm -hmm. And then Carrie, I think, is going to talk to you a little bit about 
uh, why we even wanted to tackle this from kind of her gauge perspective. So the position is a three-year fully funded position from MnDOT. Uh, that has not been offered before, and they don't know if they will be offering it again. So it is really uh, an opportunity that has come at a point where I think Rochester is ready for this kind of position because there has been a lot of activity that's already happened within the district for walking and biking to school. But, um, and some individual schools have uh, worked with community partners around specific issues. For example, Falwell put in uh, like designated a pedestrian zone in front of the school because of all the traffic. Uh, and, and in working with that, there were a lot of partners from the community, um, in addition to public health, public works, the planning department, law enforcement, all coming together to make some uh, changes, uh, including elected officials, the city council uh, made some changes in uh, one-way streets and that sort of thing. So there are community members at the table that are doing this work outside of the district. Um, when we work with the district, we are working with different people. There is not one person designated. So sometimes we're working with um, a, a principal who has requested help. Sometimes we're working with Heather Nessler who helps us uh, do some promotion of the events like Walk to School Day. Um, or we might be working with Jeff Cappers. But there is not one person within the district that has uh, their role supporting walking and biking to school. And so this is like an opportunity for the district to kind of look at that, have a position where there is a person who is looking at that vision and setting a vision for the district. It comes at the perfect opportunity within Rochester because of DMC. Because DMC, one of their top priorities right now is mode shift and getting um, more people to walk, bike, and use mass transit. And so it's not just walking and biking, uh, a lot of the traffic that we have is because people aren't taking the bus uh, that is provided by the district. And every time there's one more car in front of the school, it makes a bigger barrier for the kids who could be walking and biking, and it's scarier when there's more um, traffic. And that is exactly what the city is looking at right now um, in an effort to um, not grow our traffic within Rochester. If we had this position at this time, we could be really coordinating efforts with the, the messages that are coming out of the city. And I think we all know that in changing social norms, it's easier to change kids' behavior than it is to change those of us who have already kind of set our, our behaviors. So uh, I think this is uh, just a perfect opportune time for the district to be able to um, tap into an opportunity like this. All right, and I'll just really quickly kind of wrap up with what, what we learned at Gage. Um, the community schools this year has really been focusing on studying student attendance and looking for, you know, kind of different trends and variables that impact attendance. And I kind of, with my site leadership team, as we examined the data, we found that we had a lot of students who are within the walking zone, which is a mile, they live a mile away, in one housing complex um, that were absent many days and the reason for the absence was transportation. Mom's car didn't work or those kinds of things. And so when I spoke with the students, they talked about not having, you know, they'd never walked to school before. They didn't have the route down. They didn't really know how to get to school and who to walk with. And so we started a walking school bus pilot. And in that um, time that I walked with them and some of our staff members at Gage, um, we kind of learned what some of those barriers were in actually walking the route. So we've learned what some of the infrastructure barriers were um, some of the um, things that students were facing at home, a lot of my students were getting themselves up. Um, some of the parents were working different kinds of work hours and shifts and things. And, and so through that work, this kind of came at the perfect time. I was really, really wishing I had somebody to help me coordinate our efforts to have conversations about um, not only um, getting like, safe routes to school, but looking at that infrastructure piece and seeing can we even ask the question in the future, might we get another stoplight on 41st Street? not just one in that one mile stretch, that's all they have. So questions like that um, kind of make this a, a great opportunity, I think, for us. 
So with that, I think, I think you've kind of heard the why of, of why we are proposing to do this work and submit this grant, um, what it will entail. Again, we know that we will have a coordinator that will coordinate some of these efforts. Um, some of the other what's, like I mentioned, we've all mentioned, uh, have yet to be, f to be fleshed out. And that's, that's actually purposeful because we know that we want to hire the right person um, start to build some relationships both internally and externally and s use that per person's position to start identifying some of those barriers like Carrie and, and Joanne mentioned that are keeping some of our students from walking to school. So we are hopeful that you will um, grant us your blessing to submit this grant and even more hopeful that we'll be coming back relatively soon to tell you that we actually got it. <laughs> are there any questions? Director Marvin. I just have a comment. This was 20 pages, the application. I was really, really impressed with the amount of uh, information that you included with the intelligence with which it was written. Mm -hmm. And I think it's exactly the right thing at exactly the right time. I should add that a, a, a collaborative team uh, has really been digging in it and working on this. Um, like I mentioned, we, I think they're listed somewhere. I can't name everyone off the top of my head, but a, a very extensive collaborative team has come together to make sure that they are addressing each one of those issues so that we can have a, a very robust proposal. Director Nathan. I think um, one of the components that I was impressed with was that there was the education of the community drivers because I think one of the reasons parents think it's not safe to drive to school are all of us who are on the roads not keeping our eyes out for kids so I, I was encouraged to see that that is a component and that you have the sustainability piece as you said it's a three-year grant we don't know if it's going to occur and that you have built into your planning how to make this live on in the event that the position doesn't live on after three years. So that's a great piece. Director Workman and then Seelinger. Um, this is great and I think it really fits in so well with the facilities task force and their plan and their emphasis on walkability. So as we plan our new buildings, replacement buildings, um, these kids are going to be really, really well educated by the time at least some of them will be still attending in elementary school or certainly um, will have maybe some better instruction on how to walk to their middle school or high school. So this is just awesome. I, I think it's great. Um, so thanks to this group for putting this together and um, inviting me to be a, a, see a little piece of it in the process. And I was, um, as mentioned, most impressed with those who are around the table and talking about this because a lot of times we know that schools just talk about, we talk amongst ourselves and um, you know, there was a lot of partners at the table which I think is the, it's a definite strength of this proposal. Um, I also think it's really, um, the, the little bit I have been able to um, learn more about our students, I really thank Ms. Anderson for walking with our students and finding the barriers. A lot of times I think we sit and we make assumptions about why kids aren't coming to school and um, the work that I think all our, our um, community school sites are doing this year are really finding out reasons and I think it matches perfectly with where Joanne comes from from public health and and why we want um, walking and biking and why that's good for our kids and our communities um, and and so just that added piece of we want our kids to school get to school we want them to be safe when they get to school and you know many of us sit in a place of privilege it's very easy to jump in a car and, and bring our kid when we're late or bring our kid because it's cold and we really need to recognize that you know a mile is a long walk for a lot of little kids who mm -hmm. maybe don't have somebody to help them get out the door in the morning so um, I, I can't recommend uh, strongly enough that uh, the board moves us to action and I am so hopeful uh, that we will be granted this opportunity thank you ladies I guess I would, this is a little bit out of the ordinary. Typically, we don't bring grants for board approval, but we get bonus points if the board passes a resolution <laughs> on this, so every point counts. Uh, like Deborah said, I think it would be helpful if, if the board would choose to move this to action tonight and move the process up. Did you just do that? Uh, I'd like to move this to action. Second. 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 We moved and second to discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
The resolution is as follows. Rochester Public Schools authorizes the superintendent or designee to enter into a grant agreement with Minnesota Department of Transportation for financial assistance to fund a state route to school local coordinator position and eligible expenses that the superintendent or designee is authorized to execute such agreement and any amendments without further approval by the Rochester Public School Board of Directors. Second. Any discussion? Been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. See you in a few months. <laughs> <laughs> Seven point zero two. Approval of a cooperative agreement. This is a briefing item, Mr. Munoz. Yes, at this time, I'm going to call Mark Queasley, Century High School Activities Director, to brief us on this item. Good evening, Board Chair Barlow. Board members, Mr. Munoz, Ms. Edgar, beautiful night out there. I had a hard time pulling myself in from track, baseball, softball. <coughs> Got to make hay when we can make hay this time of year. Uh, before you tonight is a cooperative agreement in adapted athletics. And currently we have adapted programs in the fall, winter, and spring. Fall is soccer, winter is um, floor hockey, and spring is softball. And currently, Byron is a participant in that co-op because of a student uh, with special needs is um, part of that program. We have a student in Rochester Public Schools who will be leaving the public school and going to Lourdes next fall. And one of the things we've tried to do with our co-ops in adaptive athletics is to make sure that we continue to offer the opportunities for those students. And so this student has been currently involved in our programs for two years. And this would be adding Lourdes to our current adapted athletic program. And so the, the new co-op would be Mayo, John Marshall, Century, Lourdes, and Byron. So that's basically what's before you this evening. Any discussion? Next move is Jackson. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Discussion? Be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District Number 535 does hereby agree to approve the addition of Rochester Lords High School to the cooperative agreement with Rochester Public Schools for, the, for adaptive soccer, hockey, and softball for students in grades 7 through 12 beginning in 2019 to 2020 and concluding June 30th, 2023. Move approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Squeezley. 7.03 resolution for non renewing probationary teachers. Action item. Pursuant to Minnesota statute section 1. 22A.41, subdivision 2A. The school board hereby declines to, re yep, to, re to renew the annual teaching contract of the following probationary teachers effective at the end of the school year. Olivia Hermans, Emily Rudolph, Catherine Simon, and Todd Solemn. As a result of this resolution, the district's employment relationship with the above named teachers will terminate effective June 30th, 2019. The school board has reviewed and thereby approves a written notice of non-renewal for each of the affected teachers. The school board chair is directed to sign the written notice on behalf of the school board. The reasons for non-renewal are classified as private personal data under the Minnesota Government Data Practices Act unless the non-renewal represents the final disposition of disciplinary action. 
The superintendent or designee is directed to serve the affected teachers with a copy of this resolution and the approved written notice for that teacher before July the 1st. If possible, the notices should be hand delivered. This is a roll call vote. I need a motion and a second, first, please. Move to Move. action. Second. Er, no. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? <coughs> All in favor? Nope. No. Okay. no. Okay. No. Roll call. Sorry. Miss okay. Amundsen? Aye. Chair Barlow? Aye. Miss Marvin? Aye. Miss Nathan? Aye. Mr. Schlusner? Aye. Miss Seelinger? Aye. Miss Workman? Aye. Motion carries. 7.04 notice of increase to student nutrition services sub pay rate briefing item. Mr. Munoz. Yes, at this time, Amy Ike, Executive Director of Community Education, will brief us on this item. Hello again. This is uh, a very short briefing, but uh, I can tell you that we have struggled this year in student nutrition services with. Um, filling our vacant positions that have come up because of illness or folks on a medical leave, things like that. And we've been, um, on average, five to six positions unfilled on a daily basis. And uh, across our system of 25 service areas, uh, this is causing several of our folks to have to do multiple duties in the same shift or to take people out of uh, leadership positions and put them on the line, which um, of course changes their duties and um, doesn't allow us to focus in some of the leadership areas that we need to on a regular basis. Uh, we can attribute some of this struggle to uh, the fact that we have not kept up with uh, current wages, and so folks who used to come and sub with us have chosen other paths <coughs> that will pay a little bit more. So we are asking you to increase that sub rate uh, from where it has been, $11.17 an hour, to $13 an hour for those who, uh, for most of the general subs, and then $13.50 for those who have worked at least five years in our system. Those are typically our folks who have retired out of SNS but still want to come back and do some subbing with us. Uh, they are well trained and can pretty much walk in the door and do the job without um, our having to back up and do extra training. And so we appreciate them and want them to come back. So we're asking for that uh, increase. And the fund balance in SNS is uh, able to withstand this increase. Director Adamson. Uh, when would this be effective, the pay increase? We would go ahead with that as soon as you approve it. Director Workman? Um, do, we ha do you have any idea what the wages or the sa benef hourly wages are for substitutes in the surrounding communities? And is this, do you think this is where they've gone or if they've just done other things in our community? I think it's other things within our community. Okay, I'm, I'm we're gonna, we're hearing some questions. anecdotal information yep go ahead is this enough of an increase uh, well that's a good question we'll we'll know I, know I think once we increase it but if it isn't we'll come back and ask again how about that <laughs> move to action second moved and seconded all in favor aye aye opposed Be it resolved with the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby approve the following student nutrition services substitute hourly pay. Rates for former staff with five or more years of employment as a district student nutrition services worker, $13.50 per hour. Rate for all other substitute staff, $13 per hour. Move approval. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> 
7.05, authorization to purchase classroom technology devices. Briefing item, Mr. Mignot. Yes, uh, Ms. Heather Nestler, Executive Director of Communication, Marketing, and Technology, and Mike Johnson, Assistant Director of Technology, will brief us on this item. Good evening. Um, we find ourselves back here three years and ago we were asking for the exact same thing. Um, so this is, just to give you a brief overview, Rochester Public Schools is one of few districts in uh, the state of Minnesota that can author ask the school board to authorize a lease levy um, dollar amount to purchase technology devices for the classroom. And back in October of 2018, um, we brought forward our tech lease levy plan to the school board and to the Minnesota Department of Education and both were approved. Um, for uh, our funding and then we brought forward the request for the certificate of participation in the end of November which also was approved so the funding source has been approved and the plan has been approved now we're asking for you to approve what we're planning to buy with the dollars and to meet our plan so every three years we go through a process where we take out our six-year-old devices from the district we recycle them mostly because you can't uh, source parts for them anymore and they're very um, we can't update software and piece and things like that um, and then what we do is we put new devices in place of those so we aren't giving new technology to the school for for better uh, to explain that better, we aren't giving new technology, we're um, off or not offering more technology, we're just replacing. So with that said, uh, we talked with our sites, our uh, principals, and then our teachers to say, what would you like to have in your building in place of this desktop that we're taking out? And so that was a site decision um, made with a dollar value that we brought to them as we're trying to be more equitable across the district with technology dollars. That said, six-year-old devices go out, new devices go in. Our principals um, wanted Chromebooks, they wanted iPads, and they wanted a different a variety of uh, desktops and laptops. So I'm kind of simplifying this, but then what we do is we take the three-year-old devices and we are the six-year-old devices, recycle them, give them new technology, and then three-year-old devices, if they get new technology, we put those in the hands of teachers since we don't have a funding source for staff. I hope that makes sense. That was a lot to try to, to bundle together. So what we're asking for tonight, after explaining that, is the, uh, to your permission to purchase 1,031 desktop computers, 168 laptop computers, 2,528 Chromebooks with Google Management License, and then 1,161 monitors with desktop mounting brackets 113 device cards, and then asset tagging from CDWG. That whole uh, total is $1.5 million and some change in your board resolution. Um, and then we're also asking to buy some iPads to replace um, iPads, or actually, are we replacing iPads? Or are we putting different ones in? We are moving the existing iPads to elementaries to oh, increase right. equity across, across the elementary sites and uh, purchasing 2,000 to Cases. replace some yeah. cases that yep. and cases because we have cases that uh, are falling apart and therefore could lead to in unintended consequences of broken screens so we're kind of juggling some things around to try to keep our fleet intact any discussion uh, director workman um as as you know i sent out some questions that i really appreciate having the answers to but um i would just like to kind of go on record that this information was really helpful to me to understand, but maybe if the if you could have provided a little bit more of that information in the briefing, that would have been really helpful, especially um, the discussion that I had um, with the bid sheet and what was in the resolution. So I, I really appreciate, appreciate the efforts you went to to answer my questions, so thank you. <clears throat> Director Nathan. So we're not a one-to-one -one district, but we're a one-to how many? We used to be um, further well, um, it's almost uh, two to one in some cases closer. We're, we're getting there. I think this plan, um, putting devices in the hands of uh, students, especially at the elementary sites, um, and uh, pulling out some labs in favor of mobile labs and Chromebooks, we're getting really close. So um, I think this will go a long way for um, teacher comfort on how to use these devices and engage students. And I think. Um, it's going further down that way, so we're much, much closer than we ever were. Director Atmanson. 
Um, at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that you were here three years ago asking for similar purchase. What was the comparison in total dollar amount? We was actually it more or less. I mean, same. I don't need a number. It's, it's, it's the same. It's the same. Um, we were approved year every three years. We come back, and the Minnesota Department of Education would not approve us for additional dollars. So. Every three years, we're approved for roughly around $4 million. And that's not just for devices. It's also for um, infrastructure pieces, safety and security upgrades, as well as um, interactive tech, uh, interactive classroom projectors and things like that. So as we get more students, you can yeah. see the dilemma so that we capped. face. Yeah. And we have it's, to make it yeah, fit. Correct, we have yes. about $4 million in total. Director Workman. It, is that a decision that's made by MDE then, or the legislature, where, where, where does that happen? That decision was made at MDE. Um, Mr. Carlson and I had, and Mr. Johnson and I had multiple conversations with MDE to see if we could push that a little bit, um, even if it didn't change the tax base here in Rochester, because it is a, a lease levy, but it was capped with um, you know, in an, a built-in inflation factor would be nice, wouldn't it, if, mm -hmm. if that dollar amount is staying the same over a, a number of years. So. Correct. Director Schulzner. Uh, great to see the use of Chromebooks. I think they're a lot more cost-effective than iPads. And where's the district at from a smart board point of view? I, I know it's not part of this, but it's related, right? Um, it is related to the lease levy dollars. We have a cost of built into that. Um, so we have three piles of money, infrastructure, student devices, and um, classroom technology. So as those smart boards age out, we, we can't purchase smart boards anymore. They don't manufacture them. Um, we are meeting with sites and talking about what they'd like to see. Does it need to be a, an interactive touch device? Um, can they use Chromebooks and iPads to interact with the, the teaching wall, as it were? Um, so we are talking with them on what they would like to see for replacements, but we do have dollars for them for that purpose, not to replace all the 600 and some odd screens. We don't have that. We, it's a portion, about a third. And are there any sites that are both iPad and Chromebook? Yes. Um, most of uh, the elementaries are, are kind of doing both. Um, at the higher levels, fourth, fifth grade, they like a keyboard for some longer typing assignments. Um, at the younger grades, they like the, the interactive touch. That works well. Typing, not so much. So um, there is a mixture there. Um, we have some middle schools that are all iPads, some that are mixed. Um, and with this plan, it's going to be a mixture. Okay. And one last question. When I used to be part of the Public School Foundation, you'd get lots of grant requests for accessories. How's the district doing in that space and providing enough accessories to support the technology? Accessories as in keyboards? Keyboards. Mm -hmm. um, that comes out of our, our fund source, generally, or the site dollars, depending on what the need is. We try to work with sites if there's a specific need, um, say, a site is primarily iPads, and they they need a, a classroom set of keyboards um, to do some of those longer typing assignments. We'll work with them on purchasing those, but it's not a, a, a large need. There's some things, but um, okay. we generally cover those with levy dollars. And they ha they have supply budgets as Correct. well that they yes. could use to purchase those. Sure, I, I just remember there used to be a yes. lot of requests for it, and it's mm -hmm. great to hear that sound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Additional questions. Is a um, briefing item that's. Uh, I'd like to move it to action. Okay. Second. And moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby authorize the purchase of 1,031 desktop computers, 168 laptop computers. 2,258 Chromebooks with Google management licenses, 1,161 monitors with desktop mounting brackets, 113 device carts and asset tagging from CDWG in the amount of $1,557,639, as well as 2,000 iPads and 3,225 iPad cases from Apple in the amount of $700,713.75 for a total of $2,258,352.75 to be funded through the lease levy funding source. Move approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. 7.06 approval for continuation of the Microsoft 365 Education A3 license agreement. Briefing item, Mr. Munoz. Yes, uh, Heather and Mike will brief us on the as well. So Microsoft 365, um, we this is just a renewal of our software. And so um, Microsoft has changed how they're doing their licensing. We're getting the same product that we have had in the past, the ability to use uh, Microsoft Outlook, Excel, Word, and programs like that. Um, but they just changed their pricing structure. We took a look at it and we felt it was best to come back or come here and ask for you to approve a three-year agreement um, as it does save the district some money overall instead of doing a year-over-year -year agreement with Microsoft. So that's what we're here for tonight is to ask for your uh, approval of Microsoft to have on our teacher devices, our student devices, and then um, also the ability to use Microsoft when it's in the cloud. I think that sums up it succinctly. Discussion from board members? Currently a briefing item? Moved to action. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby accept the quote in the amount of $397,953, up $952.13 from Insight Public Sector for three-year Microsoft 365 Education A3 plan necessary, maintain, necessary to maintain Microsoft software and licenses on district PC hardware for staff and students. Move approval. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. 7.07 approval of bids for the facility service center dock and parking lot reconstruction. Brief and item, Mr. Munoz. Yes, at this time I'm going to call John Carlson, Executive Director of Finance, and Bill Burke, Coordinator of Construction Services, to brief us on this item. Good evening, Chair Barlow, Superintendent Munoz, and board members. I'm here um, on Scott's behalf to talk about a couple items um, that need to uh, be approved here. Uh, the first one is the Facility Services Center parking lot reconstruction, as well as a dock leveler, which Bill Burt can explain what a dock leveler is, because I don't really know what that is. Um, but anyway, the plan for this is to do this project this summer and to use the funding source um, the 2016A um, Alternative Facility Maintenance Bonds, where we had money left over from uh, the Churchill and Elton Hills remodeling projects three summers ago. So you had approved us to do that, and then we put this project out for a bid. Um, had we not found that funding source to do this, this would have come up on the plan um, about three years from now. So this kind of helps accelerate and get this done. And I can attest to uh, being a staff member and going over to FSC, it is um, a parking lot is in very bad shape right now. And so it does need uh, reconstruction. So um, Bill, maybe you could quickly explain what a dock leveler is for everyone. <laughs> well, right now they just have a, um, a concrete dock. The truck backs up to it and they drag this uh, big piece of metal out to bridge the gap between the dock and the truck and the dock leveler would be something that actually adjusts and extends out and it would be mechanical so we're not having to bend over and drag this large piece of metal. I should mention the dock leveler piece would be paid for out of student nutrition services uh, fund because that's a piece of equipment used to accept all the deliveries of food uh, to the food uh, warehouse storage there. So uh, we can kind of combine funding sources there and get this project done at one time uh, together. Comments from members of the board, Director Workman? Yeah, I have a question. So um, the, the low bid of $459,000, does that include the dock leveler? Yes. Um, okay, and then you'll be transferring money then from Student Nutrition Services to? Correct, so I think when we put the purchase order in, it'd probably be about $17,000 okay. goes to food service and about 442000 to the uh, bonds. 
leave that to you to figure out. Um, <laughs> any action. other oh. comments from? I just moved it to action. Oh. <laughs> I'll second it. Been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Be it resolved that the school board of Independent School District 535 accept the base bid from Knudsen Construction in the amount of $459,000 for the reconstruction of the facility services center dock and parking lot. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Point for the next one. 7.08 approval to purchase three articulating loaders. Briefing on Mr. Munoz. Yes, uh, Mr. John Carlson will brief us as well as Andrew Schwert, coordinator facility services, will also join him. All right. This item I'm going to let Andrew lead a little bit more. This one is uh, talking about. Uh, replacing some front end loaders that we use primarily for snow removal purposes. So, Andrew, you can walk us through this, and I can talk about the money part at the end, too. All right. Just what everybody wanted to talk about is more snow, right? <laughs> We're within an inch of the record. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, currently, we own five front end loaders throughout the district, and these are used primarily for snow removal. <clears throat> One of them is 2017, a 2019, and we have three 2001 model year machines that we're looking at that we're going to be discussing replacing right now. So some background information. Why should we own this equipment instead of leasing? Uh, we've talked about this in previous years, and really our price for leasing is about $15,000 for a season. We had leased two previous years to kind of get our feet wet with that and get some pricing models and everything, and it hasn't been cost effective. So the 2017 model year machine that we bought was initially a leased machine, and we ended up purchasing that, that machine. Our current loaders that we bought in 2001 cost us about $4,000 a year to own for the previous 18 years. Uh, in depreciation and repairs. So repairs started to climb when they were about 11 years old or so, and depreciation has been ongoing ever since they were new. Um, before we started getting into repairs on those machines, they cost us about $2,800 a year to own and utilize for the winter snow season. Um, a lot of this uh, lower cost of ownership for us is our government pricing, and we get really good government pricing on this large commercial equipment. So why should we remain in-house with our snow removal costs? Um, big thing here is that it allows us to control snow removal timing. There's a lot of factors that go into snow removal and every storm is a little bit different for us. Uh, we consider the storm timing, when it's snow start, supposed to start, when it's supposed to end, snowfall amounts, and even the weather after the storm kind of plays into how we're gonna best get it off to our parking lots and sidewalks to make the best surfaces possible. Um, we also look at events in our buildings the next day and the following days to determine when we have to start removing snow. So um, keeping this process in-house allows us to concentrate on our facilities and not compete with the contractors, other properties, and we can take into account all of these factors to best service our buildings. It also sets fixed, relatively fixed costs for our snow removal. Um, we have all the machines, they're all purchased, so we know exactly what we're gonna spend for the year. Uh, the only variable cost that we have at that point then is fuel and overtime, which are relatively small after the equipment's all purchased in, in our buildings. Um, some estimates of, rem of removing snow on our parking lots is that it saves about half a million dollars a year if we do it with our own equipment and our own staff. And that's if you take out any sidewalk snow removal and ice treatment. So if we're just looking at just what the front end loaders do in the parking lots. So why are we looking at uh, it this year? Um, one thing is the increased productivity of the newer machines over the 2001 model years that we have. 
Um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but they push about two to three miles an hour faster with the full load of snow in front of them. So over the course of a 10 hour shift working overnight to move snow in the parking lot, that can be 20 to 30 miles extra distance that you've traveled going back and forth in a parking lot. And that really adds up. Uh, our repairs are getting continually more frequent. Um, one of our 2001 model machines had about $15,000 worth of repairs this winter. So they're, they're getting to the age where we're starting to see more and more repairs. And downtime in the middle of the night could be critical for us. Uh, we, we rely on them all, all night long during a snow removal event. We don't have any spare machines, so if one were to go down in the middle of the night between the five we currently own, potentially, depending on what time of the night it goes down, about a fifth of our sites may not be plowed by in the morning. So we're looking at, with newer machines, reduced repair costs and downtime in future seasons. Uh, we're estimating that we got better trade-in values this year by trading in three units. Um, we are thinking ahead here. You know, a lot of these machines are six to eight month lead time. So we, we, we're buying this equipment a couple seasons ahead of time or at least looking at ordering it and getting it on the docket so it's here ready for next winter. Um, we also have funding available from the sale of the refuse business. So we do have a funding source for this. And also looking into the future, if a referendum <coughs> were to pass in November, we'd be looking at adding a sixth machine to our fleet with the additional parking lot spaces that we would have to clear. So we'll have quite a bit more parking lot to clear at that point. So getting down to the dollars, <coughs> bottom line here. Uh, we compared a couple of different competitive brands on the replacement loaders. We looked at specifications and quality resale values and purchase prices. And we kind of came up with $108,000 after trade for upgrading our three 2001 models to three brand new machines. I want to just point out here that I was quite surprised when I saw the numbers that how well those 2001s had held their value because I think they were $99,000 or $100,000 brand new yep. 18 years ago and we were offered $49,000 each on trade-in so they've only lost 50% of their value over 18 years. And I told Andrew I wish my car would do that because <laughs> well, that was pretty good value. And, that, and that's part of what Andrew's talking about, too, is if we were to get on more of a regular replacement schedule, uh, the trading values of these, you know, four, five, six, seven years out is, is, is pretty high, and so there's not a lot of depreciation there for us, and then we'd be able to keep newer equipment. Correct. So with all three, or with all of the loaders being late model, um, we're updating our 25-year equipment plan that was presented to the board a couple of years ago. Um, we've also made a few other changes on that plan as equipment's come up for replacement and we've either moved stuff back or moved forward just depending on the condition of that equipment and our current needs. So we've also updated that plan. Um, after going forward when we have late model equipment, we'd like to get into a six-year rotation on replacement of the loaders. So we've done a cost replacement analysis on this using a lot of estimated figures. And we're figuring after six years, trading off a six-year-old machine is going to be around $25,000 a year to trade off those machines and keep a six-year-old machine, plus inflation, of course, going into the future years. Um, keeping a late model fleet is going to keep our snow removal costs annually. It will, we'll know our costs annually. They're going to be a fixed cost, again, other than those fuel and those overtime numbers. So. Uh, depending on the snow or fall amounts that year. Um, heavy or light, heavy snows aren't going to cost us much more. Uh, if we were to contract out, most contractors go by the inch or by the snow event to bill us. Um, ours are going to be relatively fixed other than that fuel cost, which is pretty minimal. Um, and we figure that animal, annual replacements of the machines over the next 25 years are estimated to save us $125,000 rather than keeping the machines to 20 years and trading them off when they're, when they're getting older towards them. All right, and as Andrew mentioned before, the funding for this is when we sold off the refuse business last year, we received a large chunk of money. We put that in savings and just kind of earmarked it 
uh, for future facilities vehicles. So this is not coming from you know the general general fund. This is from a, a one-time sale of the business. There was about three hundred thirty thousand dollars when I last looked in that account, um, and the net purchase here is three twenty-five. So it used the majority of that money then that was sitting aside from the refuse business. Well, let me first um, say thank you, Andrew. I don't know how long you've been with the district. Uh, about 14 years, 14 about years. four years in this okay. current role. Yeah, I mean, your expertise, your knowledge, um, your skill, it, uh, um, kudos to you and your staff and thank you. Uh, those who hired you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for the information. I mean, it, it, we're saving, or you and your staff are saving the district local taxpayers almost a half million dollars a year you say because we do this I mean that's huge and yep. uh, that's a win for taxpayers I think we I need to celebrate these type of things and I thank you for your um, thorough uh, analysis uh, to include your cost replacement which I think for us is important I mean you're not just coming asking for something but you're showing to us uh, a good business it makes good business sense and so mm -hmm. I guess I'm tipping my hand, <laughs> thank uh, you. but uh, thank you. And there are other board members, Director uh, Atmanson. Jill Lewis first. Director Workman. Thank you. Um, does the a loader replacement cost, does that reflect the state contract pricing? Yes, contract these, are, pricing? these will be okay. purchased off state contract. Okay, Correct. and that's the, that is the pricing then from the state? So yes. they, yeah, they state. would have put out a bid and then Kat, John Deere, whoever would have replied to it, and this is the price now it has to be sold at. Okay. So I'm hearing that it's cost efficient. I'm hearing that it's better logistically and, and for everything else. Is there some kind of downside I'm missing? It snows <laughs> Not too much. It snows too much. <laughs> there you go. There's, there's really no anything to weigh on the other side. It's just the it's, only downside is these machines are not utilized every day of the year. Thank they goodness. Could. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're, they're heavily utilized on those nights we have snow events. Right. Um, unfortunately, those nights we need all this equipment out and running, and there's really no cheaper way to lease the machines. Right. Um, we, we do get good trade-in values because our machines are low hours, and that's part of what helps this to work is gotcha. our, our low purchase cost from the government pricing and then trading mm -hmm. off a low-hour machine. It so if like you'll it. see some of our older, our 2001 models are getting fairly rusty with the salt and the slime that we drive them through down the road, getting from site to site. They, they take a little more abuse than a machine that would sit in a quarry all its life and never sees that salt. Um, so trading them off in a six year period, they're not gonna see that deterioration. They're still gonna look good. We're gonna get some good trade-in values out of them. Director Marvin, then Workman. Well, I'd just like to say, echo Chair Barlow, thank you for your expertise and your both on the job training and then your financial expertise on this. I would just ask that um, if this passes, and I was going to move it to action, but now I won't because Chair Workman has another question. Um, but I'm hoping that she will when she gets finished with her comment. <laughs> I just hope that when you turn over the 2001 machines, that you will do a Marie Kondo thing. And after this winter, thank them for their service. <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've had a tough go. We certainly can. So, thank you. We hope the new ones, uh, new ones, if this passes, would be here before next winter, before we need to use them again. But we would not move them on until our new machines are here, you know just in case we get an awesome. October, November <laughs> snowfall. Director Workman. Is it feasible at all for us to be plowing out anybody else's lots or whatever once we're Julie, done Julie, they can't own? come to your house. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. It, we would have to add more machines. Okay. Right now, a three-inch snowfall takes us eight-plus hours to plow. So we're starting plowing at 10 p.m. the night before, the night of the storm, to have our lots clear by 6 a.m. the next day. And a lot of times, snow isn't done falling by 10 p.m., mm -hmm. so there's a lot of variables with these snowfall events. Mm -hmm. Director like Nathan, I'm sorry. Director Nathan. I'm very glad that you brought that point up. I was glad that you provided that statistic because I'm sure with the phone calls that members of our administration gets on snow days, it's important to remember yep. that if there's snow at 10 o'clock at night, it takes you eight hours to plow us out. Yep. Much longer with these 12 to 14-inch snowfall. The blizzard took us about 27 hours to plow. 
Director Workman. I'd like to move this to action. There you go. Second. <laughs> Is there a second? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby approve the purchase of three Caterpillar 926M no. front end wheel loaders from Ziegler Cat and the trade in of three 2001 John Deere 544H loaders for a total net cost of $325,645. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. And the meeting is adjourned at 7 p.m.